I'm pleased to welcome you in Rennes, and especially in this uh, beautiful room, which is probably the most impressive room in the Couvent des Jacobins. So now I'm pleased to, to welcome uh, uh, Miki Elad as the first uh, keynote speaker of this uh, conference uh, and to open the first uh, session devoted to machine learning in quantitative bioimaging. In the, in, in the continuity of the, the successful workshop uh, organized uh, yesterday. So Michael uh, Elad is a professor in the computer science uh, department at the Technon Israel uh, Institute. Uh, he, he, has, he has served as uh, associate editors for several uh, IEEE uh, journals and is currently uh, uh, editor-in-chief of the, of the SIAM journal on imaging sciences. Uh, Michael uh, works in, in the field of uh, image processing, signal processing, and with a focus on inverse problems and uh, sparse representation. He has, uh, he has been a recipient of several uh, awards uh, uh, for uh, academic uh, uh, excellence and grants, ex including the RLC uh, advanced grant in uh, 2013. So today, he will, uh, uh, he's, uh, recently he started to establish connection between sparse representations and uh, deep learning ar architectures. So I guess today he will explain his results and recent advances in that uh, topic. So I would like to thank you, Michael. So I'm going to use the yes. microphone. Good morning. So um, it's a pleasure being here. Um, my talk is about a bridge that we have built between um, the field of sparse representations. Oh, yes, where is my pointer? So a bridge between sparse representation theory and deep learning. I've been working on sparse representation for nearly two decades now. Um, there were years in, in, in which I thought that the field is, has ended and nothing else remains to be done. And then three years ago, with a, a group of amazing students, I will mention the names, we discovered this bridge between spatial presentations and, uh, and deep learning. And, and this really is something that occupies our minds in the past three years. And I will continue as soon as I get my clicker. Any questions? <sighs> really? So I will need my laptop, uh, my laptop here. Maybe then I can work. This is strange. Yes, perfect. Okay, good morning everybody. Step in, we just started. Um, I'm going to talk about a bridge between spatial presentations and deep learning. In fact, what I'm going to do today is to suggest a theory for deep learning based on spatial presentations. Now, let me give a context to this statement. You are all familiar with the notion of deep learning. This is an amazingly successful engineering discipline. The thing is, most of the knowledge in this field is empirical. Most of it has been accumulated using trial and error. We don't know why the architectures we are using are making sense, why they are successful. We don't know why the algorithms we run on top of them are doing well. We are in the dark with respect to many things when it comes to deep learning. So it has become the holy grail of data sciences to provide a theory, to provide an explanation to those things. And there are a bunch of groups attempting to provide such answers. Now, you might argue that you don't need a theory. I mean, I just told you, deep learning is successful. It doesn't need the theory, does it? Well, I would suggest that theory is important for several good reasons. First, if you have a theory, you can go beyond the knowledge that exists today in deep learning. You can go to the next levels. Secondly, you can identify the limitations, the barriers, finding whatever can and cannot be done with deep learnings. And yes, there is something else 
deep learning for many of us, I don't know how you feel about it, but deep learning for many of us feels like dark magic. In fact, in 2017, this guy, Ali Rahimi, he is an employee of Google. Google is the shrine of deep learning. Ali steps to the floor and gives a speech about a paper he got prize for, and he attacked deep learning for being the modern alchemy. Modern alchemy, this is a very strong statement. A few days later, the answer from Jan LeCun came, and the answer was twofold. Basically, Jan said, we are not against a the theory. We would love to have a theory. It's just that we are excited and we are not waiting. We are running like crazy because we are excited. And we will be happy to see theory comes, comes, coming in. And the second part, quite interesting, he said, you know, in science, many times, the, the, the practice comes before the theory. You know, airplanes were flying even before we knew anything about aerodynamics. So this was his answer, and so he believes that theory will come and will explain things after we have accumulated a bunch of knowledge in, uh, in the practice. So how do you bring a theory to deep learning? It's the way I look at it. There are three pillars on which you can build your theory. There are the architectures that we are using, there are the algorithms we run, and there is the data that we operate on. Talking about architectures, let's, for example, talk about the work by Gita and Helmut. What they will do is to, to show the expressiveness of existing architectures to explain what, that such networks can cover many, many functions, like a wide family of functions. This would help to understand that such architecture, uh, architecture are making sense. Sorry. Moving to um, algorithms, René Vidal will tell you that when you minimize using the stochastic gradient descent, your energy function has many local minimas, but actually most of them share the same height. You don't have to be worried about getting stuck on a local minima. Uh, Stefano Soato has shown, sorry, Stefano Soato has shown that uh, when you do stochastic gradient descent, you have an implicit regularization, implicit regularization that uh, is performing the information bottleneck penalty. So this connects very well to the work by Naftali Tishbi. And then there is the data. And the first person who ever said, I will bring theory to deep learning was uh, Stefan Mala. Stefan Mala with his student at the time, now a professor in NYU, uh, Joan Bona, they propose a way to explain deep learning by imitating them using what they called the scattering transform. And what they have shown is that such a transform exposes invariances which are useful for the recognition. The work that I will be putting more emphasis on is the approach by Rich Baraniuk and his students, because what they did was to suggest a generative model, probabilistic generative model for the data, and then shown that architectures emerge from it. Our work is somewhat similar to their approach, even though there are major differences. So with all this in place, you might think that there is already a theory. Not quite. What we have today is many pieces of the puzzle in a big picture that is very much still missing, and we have to work hard. I believe that in 10, 20 years from now, we will have such a theory. Here is an interesting thing. In 2017, there was a course at Stanford University Statistics Department about theories, theories of deep learning, many theories. It was ran by David Donohoe. His leading TA was Vardan Papian, my ex-PhD student, and I'll mention his name in a minute again. Here is something interesting about the attempts to explain deep learning. You, you look at the attempts, and you see that very different languages are used in order to give the explanations. Some will talk in terms of uh, control theory, for example, Stefano Suato. Stefano will speak in the language of harmonic analysis. Um, Naftali Tishbi will talk in terms of information theory. I will be using sparsity. People even brought quantum physics to explain deep learning. Um, a good friend of mine, Ron Kimmel, said, deep learning is just like a dark magic covered with mirrors. Everybody looking at it sees his reflection, which explains those languages and their variety. David Dono heard that and said, oh, those mirrors are not just regular mirrors. Everybody looking at them, hears the mirror speaking to him and tells him, you are the most beautiful. And so today, there are a bunch of researchers believing that they have nailed it. They have the answer, and everything else is just crap. And maybe this is the time to present our own approach. 
This is the work that was done by my ex-PhD student, Yaniv Vardan and Jeremiah. Yaniv is doing his postdoc now with Emmanuel Candes at Stanford. Uh, Vardan is doing his postdoc with David Donohoe at Stanford. Jeremiah Sulam went to search for a postdoc, found a faculty position in John Hopkins, and Aviad is still a PhD student. Our work will start by modeling the data. It will go to architectures. We don't have yet fingers touching on algorithms. Hopefully it will come later. It's, it's much tougher. And if you are wondering, yes, our work is the best, of course. Okay. So here is my plan for this talk. I will start by explaining sparse representations. Then from there I will move to a special case of this model, the convolutional sparse coding, from there to the multi-layer version of it. And all this will take us all the way, all the way to deep learning. Um, if you feel that the information you are getting here is not complete, you are right. This lecture is 40 minutes long. I cannot cope and cover everything. I'm skipping things, very important things. A longer version of this talk is available in YouTube. Okay, so let's start. So let's start by talking about data modeling and sparse representations. We are processing data, all sorts of data. Those sources are, are quite diverse, but they share something fundamental in common. All of them, each in its own way, has structure, inner structure. And if you think about it, the fields of signal processing, image processing, machine learning are all about identifying this structure and exploiting it. This is what we do. This is our business. How do you find the structure in a given source? The answer is using models. A model is a set of mathematical rules that you impose on your data, believing that your data should follow them. Models are everywhere. In image processing, the field where I'm operating from, models are central. They are the force behind any regularizing uh, um, technique that uh, solves inverse problems, be it super resolution, deep blurring, in painting, whatever. When you compress, you are using the inner structure. You are using models. When you tell me that you are going to sample a signal and your signal is band limited, you are imposing a model. When you are doing recognition and you have zillions of examples, you are using a model implicitly by assuming some sort of uh, PDF from which to draw those examples. So models are everywhere, and my focus in more work and in this talk would be on using the sparse land model, a model that is based on sparsity. And you see that this will take us all the way to the, uh, to the domain of deep learning. So in brief, here is the model. I have a machine and it generates signals. In, is, in this machine, I have uh, a memory holding this matrix of size n by m, n by m. I call it the dictionary, and I'm referring to each of its columns, m columns, as the atoms. Nothing happened yet. Now I'm pressing on the button, and a sparse vector alpha is created. A sparse vector alpha of length m, you multiply d by alpha, and you get your signal x. What just happened? With this alpha, we have basically uh, uh, merged several atoms together, combined them in order to create your signal X. So X is always assumed to be a sparse combination of few atoms from the dictionary. This is the model that I will believe in. This is the model we are working with. It sounds crazy, I know, but this is what we do. This is the model we will be relying on. Okay. So here is a fundamental problem in this model called the atom decomposition. I give you the dictionary, I give you the signal, and I'm asking you, find me who are the atoms that created this signal? Very simple question, presumably. Well, what I'm actually asking you to do is to solve a linear system of equation, but the thing is, it has more unknowns than equations. To your aid come the fact that you know that the solution should be sparse. So here is what you should do. You should search for the sparsest. This is our notation for the number of non-zeros. You should search for the sparsest alpha to explain x. Now, in typical cases, you don't get x that is exactly, exactly equal to the alpha. So I am willing to sacrifice, sorry, I'm willing to sacrifice. I'm willing to sacrifice epsilon error, so I'm getting a signal, and I'm willing to absorb epsilon error in describing uh, y as d times alpha. The thing about these two problems, both of them are NP-hard. You cannot solve them. Even in the noiseless case here, it's NP-hard. So what do you do? You approximate. There are a bunch of approximation algorithms. Let me show you two of them, just two, to give you a taste, because we will be using them later on. 
Remember, our goal is to find the sparsest alpha to explain why up to an epsilon error. One approach says, you know what? Just replace the L0 with L1. Replace it with L1. This is the idea by Chen, Donor, or Saunders. The year is 95. This is the well-known basis pursuit. We are talking now about pursuit algorithms. Those are approximation algorithms. So this is very commonly used pursuit algorithm. This is convex. This is doable in reasonable time. We can work with this. Thresholding, thresholding is really dumb. Thresholding is the dumbest thing you could do. It's a matched filter. You take your signal and you do inner product of these signals with all the atoms. D transpose times Y is those inner products. And then you say all the big values of this inner product should stay intact and all the small ones should be null to zero. So you pass those values, these values, you pass them through this nonlinearity element wise. This is the algorithm. Now, can we trust this algorithm to perform well? Let me show you, sorry, let me show you uh, uh, one typical theorem that explains that, yes, you can trust these algorithms. Uh, and for that, I will need to define something called the mutual coherence. So um, you take your dictionary, D, assume that the columns have been L2 normalized. Take D transpose times D and do this multiplication, get this gra matrix. And with this gra matrix now, you know, obviously the main diagonal are all ones. And who are the off diagonals? All the inner product between different atoms and themselves. And the largest in these cross product, in inner product between different atoms, is the mutual coherence. You take the maximal absolute value of this triangle, and this is the mu. And this is a property of the dictionary, mu mutual coherence. I will show you today a bunch of theoretical results. All of them will rely on the coherence. You can avoid using it, but it's very comfortable. So we are using it despite the fact that those theorems are typically weaker. OK, so armed with this coherence, here is my question. Imagine the following. A signal has been created following our model. I believe that there is a sparse alpha multiplying D to create X. Now, you don't get to see X. You see a noisy version of it. I add noise that is bound, uh, bounded by energy, and I get the signal Y. Now, you are trying to figure out who is the alpha that generated the signal. This is your question for now. And why should you want to do that? Because you could do cleaning up of the signal. You can recognize things. You could do many things once you know who are the atoms. So what do you do? You search for the sparsest alpha to explain why up to an epsilon error. But I just told you, you cannot solve this. You cannot solve this. So what do you do instead? You solve the L1 case. And here now comes the question. How far is this alpha hat from the original alpha? So here is a typical theorem. And the theorem says, you know what? If this alpha here is sparse enough, if it is not too dense, then I guarantee you that the alpha that you got is not far away from the original alpha. Not far away from the original alpha. Now, observe the following interesting thing. If there is no noise here, the problem doesn't become trivial. Not at all. It is still NP-hard. What are we getting here? We are getting here that alpha hat will be equal to alpha because epsilon is zero. Terrific. Perfect recovery. So this is one thing to notice. Secondly, this theorem is actually worst case analysis. There are better theorems. If you change the language to a probabilistic language, you will get far better uh, bounds compared to this one. And last thing, this is the theorem for the basis pursuit. Such theorems exist for many other pursuit algorithms, including, believe it or not, including the thresholding. Of course, the conditions will be harsher, but even the thresholding will have such a th uh, theorem. OK, so this was the model that we call sparse land. And now let's move to the convolutional sparse coding case, a special case of our model. So imagine the following. I have a signal, an image in this case, and I believe it to be the sum of convolutions. And those convolutions are what? We are using a set of filters, M filters, M filters. In this case, we have 16 filters. And you can think of them as filters of size uh, 9 by 9. And they are convolving what? They are convolving arrays of the same size as the image. And those arrays are sparse. So you know, this convolution is essentially taking those filters and copying them in different location and different magnitudes. This is it. So you believe that your image is a linear combination of only few occurrences of the shifted versions of your filters. This model, the CSC model, has been promoted intensively in the 90s and the 2000s, by whom? By Jan LeCun. This was the motivation be be behind and the inspiration behind the convolutional neural networks. Um, and we picked up on this model 
four or five years ago because of completely different reasons, which brought us to the connection to deep learning. So I told you that this model is a special case of sparse length. Why? It's not obvious, so let's see how it is becoming a special case. So let, let's make things simple. Let's assume that the signal we are looking at is 1D. Forget about 2D images. So X is a vector, and now I'm posing it as a sum of multiplications instead of convolutions. Why multiplications? Because now every filter will turn into a matrix like that, a matrix that is banded and circulant. So when you multiply by this matrix, a vector, you are basically convolving. We will multiply this matrix by, by the vectors gamma. Those are vectors that are sparse. And when gamma i is multiplied by ci, I'm combining few of the filters here in different locations. This is it. Now, this is the equation we get. Sum of ci times gamma i. You can write it differently by concatenating all the ci's into one big fat matrix. And you can concatenate all the gammas into one long sparse vector. And you get what? You get that your signal x is believed to be a dictionary. This is it times the sparse vector gamma. So yes, it's a special case of sparse land. Special case in what sense? In the sense that the dictionary has a special structure. In fact, this is how it looks. If I have three convolutions, then I have three such bended circulant matrices, and these com combine together to create the dictionary. Typically, we like to look at it differently by taking all the first atoms together, all the seconds, etc., and getting this block structure where the block DL here is a block of size n by m. n is the length of the filter, m is the number of the filters, and this block is copied again and again and again in a sliding fashion. This is the dictionary, this is the CSE model. There is a lot more to say about it, but I will stop now and move to the main thing of my talk today. This is where things start to be connected to deep learning. We are proposing now a multi-layer version of CSE. So we still believe that our signal x is D1 times gamma 1, where D1 is a convolutional matrix and gamma 1 is sparse. So far, CSC model. But now I add another ingredient to the story. I'm telling you, hey, gamma 1 is not just the representation here. Gamma 1 itself is the outcome of yet another CSC model. So gamma 1 is the multiplication of yet another filter uh, um, dictionary, D2 times gamma 2, where gamma 2 is sparse. And you can go on this way and add several more layers. So this is the multi-layer CSC. Let's, let's try to have a closer look at this model to have a little bit of intuition about it. OK, so when I'm writing that x equals d1 times gamma 1, I'm basically telling you that your signal x is built of atoms, few of them, taken from the dictionary d1. Fine. But now I just added to the story the fact that, hey, Gamma 1 itself is D2 times gamma 2. So you can write this equation as well. And what is it saying? It says that x equals some effective dictionary times gamma 2. Who, who are the atoms in this effective dictionary? Who are the atoms? Well, think about this. Take the dictionary D1 multiplied by the first column of D2. What are you getting? You're getting linear combination of few atoms from D1. This will be the super atoms of D1, D2. So our atoms are sort of molecules. And now this equation basically speaks to us and says, x, you are built if, as linear combination of molecules. Here it were atoms, now it is molecules. We get different descriptions of the same signal using different levels of abstraction. You know, very much like if you look at a person, this person is a combination of atoms. This person is a combination of molecules. This person is a combination of cells, tissue, body parts. You can describe the body in different levels of abstraction, all of them making sense. This model that we are proposing tries to do something similar about our signals. Let me give you an example to illustrate how things might look. I'm jumping ahead and showing you typical dictionaries for the MNIST database. MNIST is a well-known database of handwritten digits. And what we did is to train a dictionary for it. This is D1. And what you see in D1, this is actually the filters that generate D1. What you see is that those filters are what? Edge detectors of all sorts. This is what they can do. You want to create a digit from these atoms, you will have to combine hundreds of them. Fine. I want to show you D2, but I cannot show you D2. D2 is boring. I will show you D ti D1 times D2. Here it is. D1 times D2 leads to these filters. Now we get all sorts of elongated curves. You want to create your signal using these molecules? You will need several dozens of these to create your signal. 
As I saw, show you now, D1 times D2 times D3, you see complete structure. You will need to combine only a few of these to create your signal. And all those descriptions are just as correct. They are simply complementing each other. Let's talk about a pursuit problem. Just like before, we have just invented a new model. Let's speak about the need to decompose signals into their atoms. So here is my story. You get the dictionaries D1, D2 to DK. It's a fair question to ask where are they coming from, but let's leave it aside. You have those dictionaries, and I'm asking, hey, who, who are those gammas? Basically, what atoms, molecules, cells are you relying on when you are building your signal? How do you find those gammas? In fact, just like before, I will step from this naive description of the problem to this more relevant structure where I'm allowing Y to have epsilon deviation. So I'm telling you, project your signal to the model. How can you do that? Find me those gammas that can explain your signal. Okay, we are, we are about to solve this problem, but just before doing so, let me show you the result I'm getting for the MNIST database. Remember the MNIST? This is the typical digit Y. It will be projected and creating X. X is D to, D to, D1 times gamma 1. D1 is the dictionary I've shown you before, and gamma 1 is here. It's 5% full of non-zeros, 5%. It's quite sparse. It will need 213 non-zeros in order to compose this digit. The very same digit, X, can be described as D1 times D2 times gamma 2. Now, gamma 2 needs only 30 non-zeros to describe the very same X. As I move to D1 all the way to D3, I need to multiply by, D, by gamma 3. Gamma 3 has only five non-zeros combining large pieces in order to create the same digit. And all of them, again, complement each other and help. And this is what's happening in this model. Now, let's go back to the pursuit task. Remember, this is what I have. I am giving you the dictionaries, I'm giving you a signal, and I'm asking you, hey, find me the gammas. How do you do that? Let's do the dumbest of things. Let's suggest to work layer-wise using thresholding. I will take only, sorry, I, yes, I will take only the first equation and say, hey, gamma one is representing y sparsely. So let's run thresholding. Let's multiply y by d1 transpose. Let's threshold, and what do we get? We get an estimate of gamma 2. Now that we have an estimate of gamma 2, um, um, sorry, we get an estimate of gamma 1. Well, now that we have an estimate of gamma 1, and this is now playing the role of a signal, let's estimate gamma 2 by yet another set of convolutions and thresholding. And you can continue this way. Now look at this structure. Look at this structure, and look at what we typically do in feed-forward convolutional neural networks. We are doing the same things. We are convolving by a bunch of filters. We are adding bias and thresholding. Those of you who are familiar with Relia will say, hey, this is just one-sided uh, non-linearity. It's not the shrinkage that we are using in sparsity. Well, if you add to your model the assumption that the coefficients are expected to be positive, you will be using one-sided. But in fact, why should you use that? I asked experts in machine learning, why are you using values and not two-sided shrinkage? There is no good answer. There is no reason to do the one-sided, in fact. So, the two are the same, and so what I'm telling you here is that whenever you are using a feed-forward convolutional neural network, you are essentially running a pursuit algorithm. A pursuit algorithm that serves the model that we have defined. And in fact, a very dumb pursuit algorithm. This is not the message of our work. H here is the message. You see, there is a machine here that generates signals. And we think we know what's happening inside. We have a model, right? We have a set of equations that explain how the signal is created. Well, you take this signal and create a corrupted version of it. Fine, I can cope with noise. I then feed it to an algorithm that will try to find those gammas in order to decompose your signal into the atoms. And again, why should I do that? Because I'm about to recognize things in the signal based on the gammas. Because I'm doing uh, uh, some sort of inverse problem. I'm solving things with this. Okay. I can solve this, I can actually run an algorithm such as the layer thresholding, which is essentially the feed-forward convolutional neural network. I can, I can do something else. Maybe better algorithms, we'll see in a minute. But I can now ask questions. I can ask, under what conditions on the source this will be successful? These are kind of questions that nobody could have ever asked before. In fact, let me show you one such result that takes this path. I'm ju jumping straight to the theorem, and the theorem says, hey, if the source is generated such that all those gamma i's 
are sparse, and this is the condition for their sparsity, then I guarantee you, this theorem refers to the layered thresholding, I guarantee you that this algorithm will find the correct supports. It will find all the locations of the non-zeros. It will not find the values perfectly, it will find the locations. If those locations tell you a story about identity of your signal in terms of recognition, you are in a terrific shape. So this is a guarantee, theoretical guarantee for what? For the success of the feed for what convolutional neural network? Under conditions of sparsity of the generator generating things. And hey, look, coherence is playing a role here. Now, the bad news about this is that uh, we are sensitive to this ratio, the ratio of the smallest to the largest values in the non-zeros in the representations. We are very sensitive to this. And in fact, this is a well-known property of thresholding and also a well-known property of feed-forward convolutional neural networks. Another problem is this. You see, this is the equation that shows how the error propagates from one layer to the next. And what we see is that uh, this error is growing. In fact, even if the original signal is not noisy, you will get noise. So these are shortcomings. Can we do better? Of course we can do better. Why have we gone to the thresholding algorithm? We did so because we wanted an analogy to the feed-forward convolutional neural network. Let's do something smarter. For example, let's do layered basis pursuit. Still working layered-wise, which is suboptimal, but now let's do something better. This is the basis pursuit that estimates gamma 1. Okay, looking at the first equation, it will estimate gamma 1. This is basis pursuit in a Lagrangian form. And once done, move to the next layer. Now use this as a signal and do approximation for gamma 2 and proceed this way. So here is a different algorithm. Will it do better? Can we provide better guarantees for it? Let's see, here is the theorem for this algorithm. And the theorem says, the theorem says, you know what, if those gammas that generated your signal are sparse enough, and notice how civilized now the condition is, much better than before, then the layered basis pursuit will perform very well. In what sense? There are a bunch of things that are said here. We will not make mistakes in choosing wrong atoms. We will choose only the dominant atoms from within the support. We will make an error that is controllable. All sorts of things that are good news for us. Yes, this algorithm performs way better. Now, who is this algorithm in the language of deep learning? Is there any connection to deep learning? Let's see. Just before that, remember the issues I mentioned? Contrast, error growth, and error with no noise? Well, now, there is no sensitivity to contrast. We are not sensitive anymore to it. Secondly, if E here, the energy of the noise in the input is zero, all the errors are zeros, we still get the error growth. Why? Because we have chosen to work suboptimally using a uh, 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 layered wise algorithm. Can we do better? Of course we can, but I will not talk about it today. So um, a closer look at, a look at the algorithm we have just invented. Imagine that I have a model that has 10 layers. Okay, 10 layers. So basically, I need to solve 10 basis pursuits, right? This is what I've just shown you. You have to solve 10 basis pursuits. Now, how do you do that? One way of doing it is known as ISTA, Iterated Shrinkage Algorithm, or Iterated Soft Thresholding Algorithm. And this is a typical equation in ISTA. You have to multiply by the dictionary, by the dictionary transpose, you add, you subtract, and yes, you threshold. Okay, you have to iterate this. How many times? Say, 50 times. You run 50 iterations for each of those basis pursuit algorithms. Now, unfold this algorithm. Unfolding means take those 50 as a series of steps, then the next 50 for the next basis pursuit, etc. You get sort of a neural network with linear operations followed by thresholding. And what is it looking like? It looks very much, very, very much like recurrent neural networks with one major distinction. It looks like recurrent neural network, but it is doing something that we understand. It's solving this set of basis pursuits. And in fact, we know exactly what are the limitations and where are the conditions for success, because the theorem before is exactly relevant to this case. So we get this. By the way, as a side note, in this architecture that we have just created that has 50 times 10 uh, um, steps, so 500 layers, you don't really have to train 500 layers of parameters. It will be a mistake. Every 50 share the same parameters. So basically, there are only 10 sets of parameters. Each basis pursuit ha has its own dictionary in just one dictionary. This is something that people in deep learning are not seeing because they don't think this way.
By the way, we tried this. It works amazingly well. Few reflections and uh, recent results. How, how do I do with time? Charles, do you know? Five minutes? Ten minutes is perfect. OK. You should be bothered by my lecture, because I kept talking about connection to deep learning, but there was no, no mentioning of what? Of labels. Where are the labels? In deep learning, we are all, almost always working supervised. There is the input signals and the label corresponding to it. Where is the label? One possible answer is to say, forget about labels. This is way stronger, because it's a model that can uh, show you connection to deep learning architectures working unsupervised. You can actually train the model to drive the sp those sparsities you believe in. And then you get very interesting autoencoders, very interesting uh, uh, animals that look like autoencoders. Another answer could be entirely different. You want labels? Here they are. This synthesizer now generates not just the signal, but also the label. How? By creating a linear combination of the representations with a bias and then sign. I'm thinking binary uh, classification. And now every signal is accompanied by a label. And now think about it. When a generator of signals and their labels work this way, it makes so much sense to do exactly what we have done. Approximate gammas, because with those gammas, you will be able to do the classification. And if you have a better pursuit algorithm, that means closer to the true gammas, you will have better accuracy in classification. In fact, in a recent work, we have shown the connection to adversarial noise. I will mention this in a minute, so let's leave it. A second question that must bother you is, where is the learning? Where is the learning in this regime? Well, the learning, in fact, should appear in every one of those models, and it is basically finding the dictionaries. We need to do dictionary learning algorithms. When it comes to sparse land, we are equipped very well in algorithms that are training algorithms and even a beginning of a theory for that. For the CSC, we have a bunch of algorithms. The picture becomes clearer and clearer as we move. There are several dozens of options. No theory, by the way, no theory whatsoever. And when it comes to the ML CSC, there are only two algorithms that train dictionaries. Both of them are ours. And we needed them simply because we wanted to demonstrate the model. So we had to train dictionaries, just like I've shown you with the MNIST. Few glimpses of recent papers that we published, and I finish. This paper was the first to suggest a dictionary learning algorithm for this MLCSC model. This paper was the first to say, stop working layer-wise. Come up with a holistic pursuit algorithm that find all the gammas together, and then show that this works way better than the layer-wise approach. This paper, I mentioned before, is asking the following question. What is the strongest possible noise in the input that still guarantees that the classification doesn't change. This is the first work that uses the labels that I mentioned before. Now, this is a crucial question because there is a, an amazing situation in neural network. You can take a neural network that has been trained, working perfectly well on the test data, and then you can squeeze a little bit of noise to the input and confuse the system. Let it go to different classification. And the noise doesn't have to be strong. So this is known as adversarial noise. And what this work shows is that uh, you can actually bound this noise and, and show that it is related to the kind of architecture we are using. When you are using better pursuit algorithms, you are less sensitive. You are more robust. The last work is work with Amir Beck, where we try to generalize ISTA and FISTA to the multi-layer model uh, in order to come up with new architectures and we had just submitted it to PAMI. So this is it, this is my lecture. We started with models and their importance, sparse land especially. Then we moved to the CSC, the Convolutional Sparse Coding Model, um, which is a special case, but of great interest. And then from there, we moved to the multi-layer Convolutional Sparse Coding Model, which has a connection to deep learning. This connection is the emphasis of this talk and the main message to take home. Apparently, if you think in terms of this model, you have the grounds to analyze architectures, to give birth to architectures, to explain their limitations, and go beyond. Um, I just want to mention, sort of promotion, that I'm teaching a MOOC, a massive open online course on sparse representations under edX. It's open to everybody all around the world. Uh, I'm not teaching this content of the talk because it's very recent, but I'm teaching all the concepts of sparse representation, the theory and practice in image processing, basically building the foundations for the work that I've done. This is it. Thank you very much. Thank you.
questions. Uh, the, the question I have is, did you compare your theory on, on ap applications typically? Uh, have you good results compared to the basic deep learning approach? Of course, of course. Yes. So in, in those papers I mentioned, yeah. all of them end in a, in a chapter of experiments where we take our architectures with all the constraints. For example, if in ISTA we multiply by D and D transpose, it should be the same parameter. We force all those parameters, we create the architectures, all programmed in PyTorch, and we demonstrate these on common problems, CIFAR, ImageNet, etc. and the results are amazing. The results are not falling behind well-known architectures. We can actually train on less data, all sorts of other things. For example, in the work on the adversarial noise, we actually show, we show that the architecture we are proposing are more robust. Okay. Yes, so we do that. It's painful. This is the, pain, the, the most painful part of this work because it's so fun to write theorems, but then you have to simulate things annoyingly. Hi, I have a question. There are still quite some uh, free parameters in your algorithm. Of uh, course. The number of the threshold levels and the levels of sparsity of all these layers. How do you choose those? You are completely right. We are not providing a complete answer that will tell you exactly what to do. I don't know the number of layers. I don't know the dictionaries for those layers. I don't know the thresholds. You are completely right. When we are practically experimenting, we are learning all of those. We are, here is what we do. We take our pursuit algorithm, create an architecture from it, and from there we forget our own view. This is an architecture, and we let, we let the st uh, stochastic gradient descent learn everything. And this is how we, as we, we assess our uh, methods. And is it the best way to go? I'm not sure. But I'm not sure there is another way. Thank you. Um, is it, can you model your, do, do you have a completely dual space, let's say, that you can model, let's say, a multi-layer uh, network with your sparse representation? So you can just steal their parameters and then optimize them to make it more robust? So the question is, uh, is about going backwards from existing network back to our model. We are working on this. Not every architecture that someone will propose, for example, I don't know how to take a gun and turn it into something that relates to my model. So th this, this passage is not clear to us and it's not well mapped. Some architectures can be mapped and then we can do things. And in some of the experiments, we are actually uh, uh, taking the dictionaries that were learned using classical uh, machine learning methods and then taking them and say, oh, those are the dictionaries, let's use them for something else. But this is not a, 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 a road that is taken easily. Okay. Thanks, nice talk. Um, I know very little about deep learning, sorry, so my question might be a little bit naive, but is there an equivalent of a likelihood function, some way of incorporating systematically known measurement error, no, uh, known measurement error sources, for example? I'm not sure I follow your question. Well, for example, your data comes with noise. Those noise follow known statistics. For example, if you know the something about the apparatus. Ah, yes, okay. Is there a, a systematic way of incorporating that? Oh, yes. Statistical yes. distribution from which... Wonderful question. Imagine, I don't know, most of the things I've shown here with L2, basically underlining an, an assumption that the noise is Gaussian. Now, suppose that I know that the noise is not Gaussian, Poisson. Okay, then the equations will look different and those equations will lead to different architectures. Nobody ever tried those architectures, but they will make so much sense. So it must be done. It should be done. Okay, okay thank you very much. Thank you, Michael, for this uh, beautiful talk.